Welcome to the first 30. Elaine McCluskey is here with us to talk about her collection of short stories, Raphael Has Pretty Eyes. Uh, it was an impressive collection of short mm -hmm. stories. I can't wait to talk about it. Um, uh, short stories are always in, amazing to our collections are always amazing to me because of how uh, co cohesive it ends up being at the end or feeling at the end, despite the individual experiences. Um, but before I get started, Elaine, is it okay if I share my little blurb about the Please do. collection? Please do. Raphael Has Pretty Eyes yeah. is a gorgeous collection of 17 stories that each in some way caught me off guard. I read a Miramichi review, which references, references the first story. It's never what you think it will be. And like the reviewer, I had that ping moment when I realized that this is in fact the collection. Each story in some way is not what you think it will be. The collection is surprising, heartwarming, heartbreaking, funny, all of the things you want in a collection of short stories. They're about people on the edge, either having just come through something or about to unknowingly drop off. It has been described as both a collection of stories with a real maritime vibe, but also a universal collection. Each of these stories brings you to a life altering or life affirming moment in the lives of some of the most fascinating characters I've ever read. Thank you so much. Thank very you. Very observant and very lovely. <laughs> it was, it really was um, each and every story, an individual experience, but at the same time, and every time I read a story, I felt like I was looking for that connection, looking for right. um, the the moment in time that um, the, one of the characters was maybe talking to another character or about another character. Um, it was great. Mm -hmm. I'm excited because you're going to share 30 uh, lines of one of the stories, and I'm excited okay. to uh, discover which one you've decided on. Okay, well, what I've decided to do, um, since you're about the first 30... I'm going to read the first 30 lines in the book. Yay. So, yeah, I'm going to read from the first story, um, which is called It's Never What You Think It Will Be. And um, I think the story, uh, by the time you get to the end, uh, the title makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I'm going to start with the first 30 lines. And it's one of those stories um, where I try to um, establish a tone and a mood right from the beginning. So I'm just going to go with that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I am at a toast and roast for my mother's fourth husband, Wayne. Wayne, of course, is a dud. Who else do you get on the fourth attempt, Idris Elba? I bought my, brought my roommate, Cedric, because I like having backup when dealing with my mother, the master of the emotional ambush. You never know when you arrive at a sushi bar for your 30th birthday, if your new stepfather will be there holding a foil balloon. You never know if his name will be Scuffy or Dwayne. The roast is at a Lions Club hall with shaky ceiling tiles and 20 tables dressed up like they're going someplace special. On the tables are programs, each with a photo of Wayne, wearing the smug face of a reality TV polygamist. Outside, it is winter and cold as hell. Imagine if you live, live someplace hot, says Cedric, as we locate our table on lucky number 17, say Marita, and every day you could just get up, put on a t-shirt and live. Sounds sick, I admit, buying in. Is that what makes a Canadian, Cedric Gass, the ever-present fear of perishing? He gives me that look, the one that tells me we are leaving the here and now. We are strapping on our what-if wings, and we could if we tried hard enough, be MMA fighters or berserkers, we could be heroes. Is that why we high five each other when one of us defies those fears? When one of us does something batshit crazy, like the dude in Alberta who decided to fight a cougar barehanded to save his dog? A cougar, I'm impressed. Outside of Tim's, I guess I'll just put down my double double and fight a 200 pound wildcat known to kill animals four times its size, a predator that can jump 20 feet. I'll just fight him because I love my dog. Well, that's something, isn't it? I had a girl and I thought she loved me, but she didn't, says Cedric. How'd you know? She slept with my brother. I had a girlfriend who only dated me because I owned a Newfoundland dog. And then we both stare at the head table. 
and I get that feeling. The one that convinces me that life is one inside joke after another, and that people fall into two categories, the people who believe Trailer Park Boys is real and the ones who don't. And I no longer know where I fit because last night I saw Bubbles driving a Maserati Quattro Porto with smoke windows on the Waverly Road in Dartmouth, and it seemed quite normal to me. It seemed as normal as anything I am doing on this particular fucked up day. 30 lines. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm so glad that, uh, well, I, I would have been happy regardless of what story you sure. read 30 lines from, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about in this collection are the names. Oh, and yes. in this first story, the uh, ex-husbands and current husbands' names are Wayne, Dwayne, Blaine, and sure. you talk about nicknames and throughout the story, that's one of the recurring themes is, is um, names. And I yes. wanted to talk to you about that, not just the challenge of naming characters in stories, mm -hmm. which, which mm -hmm. I always find an absolute uh, nightmare, sure. um, but your feeling as a writer about the names of characters and, and the impact mm. that may or may not have on, on a certain story. Great question. Um, I sometimes confession change the names. Once I'm written a story and I'll look back and maybe two of the names will be too similar. Um, so it's it's I want you to remember which character I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason I give people names. I have one uh, story the lead character's name's Morton. Well, I don't know that many Mortons, so I think people are going to remember that's Morton. So right. the Wayne, Blaine, and Dwayne, that was a little self-indulgent joke on my part. Um, but uh, I think I do think uh, quite a bit about the characters. I think I have a girl in one of the stories who's very sympathetic, and her name is Hope. And uh, that's one of the things in her life. She's very ill, and she has hope for her future. So I, mm. I think that's subconsciously why I named her Hope. Uh, but I will go through sometimes and the story will be done. I go, no, that name is, it's not, it's not different enough or it's not mm. representative enough. And I will go back and change the names. Yeah. But when you sit down to write, it, did the names just kind of pop into your head and you just kind of go yeah. with it. Yes. I, I'll, I'll do an old writer's trick. Sometimes I might look, uh, if I'm a very local story, I may look through the local obituaries <laughs> until I find a name that I really like. Same, I'm writing about old people and they might have, you know, old people names. Yeah. I'll go through the local obituaries. Oh, there's one you, you don't hear anymore. That, that might give, you know, that might be my name in the story. That's, so, yeah. a, that's actually a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not a bad gonna, trick. I'm not going to not steal that idea. That's really yeah. yeah please do. <laughs> yeah. And uh, within yeah. um a, a lot of the stories, right. what is remarkable to me, and again, this might not be every reader, but what is remarkable to me is the voice. Mm. Not just that you write, you cross gender, you write men, you write mm -hmm. dogs, um, mm -hmm. you write women, young, old, um, yes. middle aged, and so I wanted to talk to you about that. That. Mm -hmm bearing in mind when the spark of an idea comes yes the bearing in mind of who's going to tell the story is that mm -hmm. something instinctual or does that come uh as you write it happens two ways sometimes I know the voice when I start and sometimes I know the place when I start and then I have to find the voice um but I do think voice is one of the things that um comes easier to me than other things. Mm -hmm. So I, I do not, maybe I'm kidding myself, I do not find that much trouble inhabiting strange bodies and even animals. Um, I do find that once my head clicks into that person and once I know what it is that makes that person work, then mm -hmm. I can find the voice. Like I'm working on a story now and it's okay, but I haven't clicked into what this person's main driving forces in life yet so I don't quite have his voice and when I figure that out then I think I'll be able to make the story work yeah and when you think about <clears throat> characters who yes who will you know the tertiary characters and all of the the kind mm -hmm. of setting setting characters how do you know that they I'm thinking specifically about the bear in yes. <laughs> the four at the end uh, when does when does he exist when does he come to the mind. bear and well yeah. the bear and and the other characters that uh, uh, they just that that story had a strange origin it actually um 
uh, started with me eavesdropping in an airport. So the two main characters were having a conversation behind me. Mm -hmm. And it was a fascinating conversation. I go, oh, um, this is a story for me. So then it just started to unfold. And then as it got a little more bizarre than the bear, and I had seen a man walking through the airport carrying a stuffed bear. Right. And I thought, well, that's that is that is curious. So I thought, well, he can be on, he can be with them, he can be in the story. So then I, I was feeling a little um rebellious. So I had the bear say some rather outrageous things and some provocative yeah. things. So yeah, that that's how that happened. Yeah, it's funny because when he he says a few things that uh, yes. that I thought, wow, this is a really good um device to get not a real character but to get that you know horrible perspective that people yeah. have on I mean, we on... can't blame because it's a bear <laughs> well, exactly and you just go oh yeah oh my god can you say that well you know you can't but a bear can um I thought it was fantastic and then and then uh this doesn't have anything to do with the ending so I'm gonna share sure. the fact that the bear greets another bear at the airport at the end, I thought was just oh, honestly good. magical. It was, it, Thank it you. is one of those moments in a short story that takes you off to another short story. Yes. And yes. Thinking about these people. Yes. And they're bears and does the other bear talk and yes yes yeah. oh thank you I'm glad I, that was a story as you know it was left a little bit open-ended mm -hmm. uh, for those reasons because I thought no I think readers can uh, buy into this and they can do just what you are talking about wondering what's going to happen so I kind of left it that way yeah. yeah that was fantastic thank you <laughs> I I the the most uh I think uh thing that connects a lot of the stories for me was the how the beginnings and the endings talk to each other yes. and I am always uh, the reason this series exists is because I'm just fascinated by the first mm -hmm. 30 lines the first 30 pages yes. first the openings of stories mm -hmm. but what I loved about each of your stories was that when I got to the beginning or got to the ending mm -hmm. I thought wow this ending really speaks to the beginning and I wanted to talk to you mm -hmm. about that um, is it, is it something that just is your style, your writerly style that you, you sort of ebb and flow and then come mm -hmm. back and I close the circle or was mm -hmm. it a deliberate thing for Raphael? I think it, I think it is my style. I don't, um, I don't, uh, think about what I'm doing when I'm doing that, but I do like to have a thread that connects. And I do like to have that eureka moment at the end when, when things tie up, um, I will make one confession. Occasionally, occasionally I don't know the ending when I'm starting Well, quite mm -hmm. often. And I may then have to go back and retrofit the story to make, uh, mm -hmm. to make the ending make sense, you know, to put a little clue here or a little clue there, nothing over the top, but just something, um, like I was talking with the Flannery O'Connor, you know, story of the good man's hard to find. The misfit mm -hmm. murders the family in the end. And if you go back, the misfit pops in about four, his name four times during the story. Yeah. So I like to have, I like to have some type of um, a little clue uh, if it's an unusual ending. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, but yeah, I do try to tie everything up. Hmm? Yeah. Especially yeah. because that if, if, and a couple of the stories do take a, like a sharp left turn yeah. But in it, just as you say, in not in a way where, you know, some occasionally you can read a short story and when it takes a sharp left turn, you're like, oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Your every single one of your stories take that turn. Mm -hmm. And even though it's surprising, mm -hmm. it really is. Holy smokes. Yes. Because I felt so invested in the character. Yes. That when the when that happens to them. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, uh, that, like I said in the beginning, either it's like, oh, or, oh, and you're hopeful mm -hmm. or um, fearful for what's coming next for the, the mm -hmm. characters. Thank you. Great. Um, I, I do try, um, well, I don't really think that much about the structure. I do uh, try to always have at least uh, some one visceral moment in a story um, where the reader is either going to cry or they're going to laugh or both yeah. hopefully and, and it's kind of they call it you know the gut punch paragraph I like to have at least one gut punch paragraph in a story because you don't have that much time in a short story to have an impact and I think that's the purpose of a short story to have an impact and then for readers to finish and say what did I just read 
where yeah. a novel you have you can educate you can you can do all kinds of things with a novel but mm. my uh, goal with a short story is to have impact yeah and yeah. it's true that short stories are you know slices of life yes and in any remarkable slice of each any of our lives there is that moment where you're just like, oh crap, did that really happen? Or yes. Um, yes. whatever. And so I love that reflection of of yeah. not just not our own personal real life experiences, but that emotional experience of life. Yeah. And, and what I do try to do is I do try to um think about personal experiences, but uh in a in a different situation. So, you know, uh, sadness feels the same betrayal feels the same disappointment feels the same mm. so you think about those points in your life and we've all had them and then you can hopefully transfer those to a character and to a story yeah exactly and I think that Raphael has pretty eyes does that with almost every single story oh, thank you yeah um we t you talked about um not thinking too much about the structure within uh between the beginnings and the end but what i right. noticed is very few of the stories in this collection have a chronology to them like you know uh, then then this happened then this happened then this mm -hmm. happened there's a mm -hmm. lot of um uh conversation i guess going on between moments from the past mm -hmm. you know, and moment current moments or moments from one of the characters experience right. how yeah how is that because it it is a very familiar mm -hmm. uh, feeling i guess that is yeah. experienced with each of the stories that we're kind of moving around in moments of the characters yeah. lives i think um you're right it, not, there aren't too many of the stories that you know like start out like a fairy tale in the beginning and then the yeah. end um so I think they're more cinematic you know we I have a lot of scenes mm -hmm. and those scenes are uh, meant to convey feelings or uh, the person's state of mind and I'm letting those scenes uh do the telling mm -hmm. uh while showing I'm letting them do the telling as opposed to you know starting at point a and going to point c yeah and that yeah. the that is kind of um that feeling of moving around comes alive in the story yeah. um, with dear Deidre, the email story. Um, yeah. What's it like? I think. Oh yeah. <laughs> what's it like? Yeah. That again, yeah. the the moving from character mm -hmm. to character and moments mm -hmm. in each of their lives. Yeah. This this question is going to tie together the previous question and the one before sure. that about what can exist outside of a story for the reader uh -huh. and that movement, that moving around from uh, not just what is happening for each of the characters in the email, but mm -hmm. how Deidre responds to them yes. uh, gives me an idea of what's, what's going on in Deidre's mind, which I thought was so great yes, because her you. responses to the majority of the emails are one line or yeah. maybe two lines and right. her response says as much as as the e the emails from these strangers right. do yeah. yes so let's talk about the characters in the emails and oh, yes or not sure. you want them to exist for the reader off of this or if it was really just about affecting uh response from Deidre um and how this story came to be I had so much fun writing that story. I, 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 I have two stories in the collection um, that I, I consider experimental. And yeah. I kind of think they're palate cleansers in between the longer stories. So that really uh, was inspired by an actual uh, Twitter uh, from the actual Globe and Mail asking people to tell them what it was like to be married three times, oh, good geez. or bad for a story and I thought that is the most absurd thing I've ever heard so and I used to be a journalist so uh, I thought so my idea of that story was to take an absurd um, premise that people are going to write in and tell somebody well what do you think it's like right? yeah. like what do you literally think it's like so I thought well uh, this is so absurd I'm going to make it more absurd so then I um, came up with all these people who responded to the ad and I tried to keep them different you know I tried to give you know I think it's, I've got maybe six of them and they're all different from each other yeah and um, I just it was just me an exercise in absurdity basically and Deidre uh, is um doesn't care about them at all 
Like yeah. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. obvious. She doesn't yeah. care. She's just doing it to get her assignment done. And right. so, you know, they'll say something awful and she'll go, oh, you know, too bad or whatever. Hope you have a nice life. So <laughs> she's not invested in this at all. And they're pouring their souls out about their three marriages. And yeah. she's just, yeah, yeah, right. So she doesn't care. So and then, yeah. So that was the, uh, that's how this, that story originated. And I did have an awful lot of fun doing it. So, oh my gosh, each one of those emails. <laughs> Yeah. And I wish, I mean, I, 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 I would love yeah. for you to, to yeah. read one of them, but we'll see how our time goes. Sure. Each one of those was, and yeah. I'm sure you've had this experience when you've read someone else's uh, work. Sure. Was one of those moments where I'm just like, oh man, that's just creative genius. Like how, <laughs> how did that come to be? And same yeah. with, with Harold, Harry, the, the journalist who gets fired and, <laughs> Oh yeah, For that was the other reason, uh... The HR department decides to send him <laughs> a, a survey to fill out again, yes. not not just the premise, mm -hmm. but his responses to each one yes. of those HR survey mm -hmm. questions was yes. like, oh my gosh, yes, a, a, an idea that that you know you you wish you had. Yeah, that, that was just the two stories both um, originated from real things. Like I've known people who've gotten fired and received exit surveys and, and they ask questions like, would you come back? Well, hello, you just fired yeah. me. So I, <laughs> I saw that again as such an absurd situation that I was going to make it more absurd. So Harry's responses were just off the chart. Oh my gosh, off so good. Chart. His wow. response to if you would come back is just <laughs> absolutely genius. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you. good. <laughs> um, the, the recurring themes, and this is, uh, maybe part of a few questions that I've asked, but the recurring themes and the recurring characters, mm -hmm. I found myself, and I don't like to, I don't like to do this because sometimes I feel like if, if it was meant to be that I connect a character from one story to another, it would be more yes. overt and more yes. explicit. So I try not to, if I notice, right. I try not to look mm -hmm. out for it because I feel like it, aff it affects the story, but there are some moments where you're like, oh no, is that the same person from here? You know, is that the same weird guy on the bus from mm. that story is, mm. you know, how is it possible that she's Deidre's cousin? Is yes. it the same Deidre? And, you know, so I love that this yes. collection has those connections. Yes. But they're not explicit and they're not drawn, yes. you know, there isn't a map sure um, there and so yes. when you're putting this collection together are you thinking like is there sort of a map of the world that um, all of the characters are living not in? a map of a world but I, I'm trying to remember I think one story I did deliberately make the, the same character in another story maybe it was the bus one of the bus stories I'm not sure uh but um I think that was the only one where I consciously made person in in more than one story and I thought okay we can just have a little fun here we can just do something with that but otherwise the stories were written separately you know yeah. all the different occasions and then put together and I had a magnificent editor Bethany Gibson and we changed the order a tiny bit in the collection but not very much mm -hmm. and yeah so they they were all their own uh their own creatures with except for the one story that had a bit of a connection yeah. And the, um, the crazy person on the bus also exists in uh, a story mm -hmm. that is surprising again, the, the sharp mm -hmm. turn, but I yes. wanted to talk to you about these little tiny things that, that mm -hmm. occur throughout. And maybe it's not, maybe it's not something that's deliberately connected or needs to be connected. And I've, mm -hmm. I just noticed them, but the writing of graphic novels and the writing of, of, you know, stories that need illustration mm -hmm. and the journalists, those are those just um, parts of your life or are those things that you wanted to just have as part of the uh, characters' lives? Uh, the journalism part, I should confess, that came quite easily to me because I was a journalist. I taught journalism. Uh, my husband's a journalist. So that was kind of, um, I didn't have to do any research to right. do that story whereas I have one story that's set in a payday loan company oh. and I knew nothing about payday loan companies but I knew somebody while going to university who worked in one 
So um, I got a lot of information from him. And then I also went and visited one. So uh, so I didn't know anything about that. Um, the political roast, um, I had I had the misfortune of attending two, <laughs> and they were horrible. And so then I decided, well, I'm going to I'm going to do something with that. I had if I had to sit through that, I'm going to get a story out of it. So that's where the the political roast came from. But yeah, yeah, no, that was great. Um, I want to talk about what you are writing next, but we are we have five minutes. So okay. if you want to read one of those emails? Oh yes, to sure. Deidre, I. Ideal. I just feel like anyone who's watching this video, if this okay. does not make okay. you want to read the collection. Okay, thank you. I'm going to read the first one. Uh, so the setup is um, a, tw a tweet from the Globe and Mail. Are you on your third marriage? What's it like? Pros, cons? Email our reporter Deidre Fairfield for a story. And then we give Deidre's um, email address to Deidre. From Greg Mack at yahoo.com. Yes, I am on my third. What's it like? Think back to when you were a teenager and imagine that you were the only kid in your neighborhood forced to attend summer school because you flunked algebra. It's the same feeling of dread and shame when you wake up each morning and the sun may be shining and your friends may be heading to Chesterman Beach in a van, but you are trudging to summer school, a failure. It's like that. And you don't know why it happened. You tell yourself you were just lazy, People underestimate laziness. They mistakenly believe that underachieving children must be troubled or failed by their parents when some are just lazy. You hope it's that. But you fear it is something worse. You fear that you are so deficient that you never may never be good at anything in life. Like summer school, a third marriage is your last chance. The one thing that stands between you and that dirt road trailer with power lines running from someone else's house a plastic rainwater collector and an angry dog chained outside. The pros. Christmas or Easter are never boring. When you have an extended and estranged family, large enough to stage a full production of Come From Away, someone is bound to go off, and they always do. And it makes you question every decision you've ever made in your life, every road taken and not taken. And self-examination is a good thing, isn't it? The cons. Think about it, signed Robert. And then he writes, I would prefer that my real name not be used because, well, I'm sure you know why. <laughs> so good. So, so <laughs> thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like Deidre, was, uh, Deidre says, are you available for an interview about your worst Christmas? We could use your initials. Yeah. And the funny, the funny, the funny thing is, <laughs> in her response is it's like the, with each response, you're wondering yes. whether she's being genuine at all with yeah. any of them. So <laughs> it is, it's so great. Thank you so much for reading that. I, I love that story it was, so much. It's fun. It's always fun to read that. Thank you. So before we sign off, I would yes. love to talk about what you're working on right now and what's what other creative things are happening uh, for you. Well, I am working, um, I go back and forth um, uh, between short stories and novels, and I'm now working on a novel, and it's pretty much finished, and I'm going to be talking to my lovely publisher soon, and uh, I'm very excited about it, um, but uh, yeah, so it's a novel that's set in Nova Scotia. And uh, it has a, fem a strong female voice, a, a female narrator. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I have, when I want to do bad things to people, I have male main characters. But <laughs> oh. did you want to talk at... about the psychology of that? Yeah, I, I just can't. Be, I can't be that mean to women, or I feel like a bully if I'm mean to women in my stories. I feel that. So if something yeah. bad's going to happen, I figure, well, this man, he can take it, he can handle it. Um, so, but this novel, the um, narrator is going to be a, a female, and uh, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. So that's what I'm working on. Nice. I'm I'm excited. I Thank I, uh, I um, hope all the best for it and uh, that it uh, finds a home with the publisher and that we get to see yes. it. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for everybody watching this video, you can find out more about Elaine at www.elainemccluskey.ca. You can also buy your very own copy of Raphael Has Pretty Eyes from Goose Lane directly, <laughs> www.gooselane.com. And you can find out more about our upcoming events at junctionreads.ca. Elaine, thank you so much. This was a pleasure.
Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Probably more fun than I should have had. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it, how could we not have had fun with this collection? Thank that, you. That, what, it, right. what it was meant to be. Yes. All right. Thank you again and have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>